Hey everyone, it's Kyla. Welcome to my channel where we talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. This is a sort of a finalish piece to my vibe session series that ended up being a series. So I published uh, four pieces talking about data versus reality, the vibe session, people are what matters, and then the concept, do we even need a recession at all? In other news, I was on Trillionaire Mindset about two weeks ago now. So please go check that out. Ben and Emil are awesome. But I really do want to kind of get into this concept of vibes. Let's discuss the vibes. This is sort of the guiding image for this piece. So the Fed setting the vibe. Inflation, monetary policy, Fed action, Fed credibility, Fed liquidity, and the certainty of uncertainty. So the inflation report, the CPI print, came in really hot last week. It was 9.1% headline inflation, which is psychologically a pretty tough level. I have a whole video walking through what happened with the inflation report if you want to go check that out. But basically, you know, the Fed normally targets an inflation metric of around 2%, and we got a 1.2% print for the entire month of June. It was a pretty broad-based increase, meaning that inflation Inflation is coming from everywhere and it doesn't seem to have peaked yet. It was also after a pretty big 75 basis point hike from the Fed in their most recent meeting. And now everyone is like, they are going to do a 100 basis point hike in their next meeting to slow inflation down. Nick from the Wall Street Journal basically said that they're going to do 75 again. <laughs> so we will see the Fed just entered their blackout period. So we'll see what comes out of the, the next meeting that they have. And of course, I'll be talking about it. Inflation is decelerating, but service prices, food and energy are definitely not. Things are expensive. People are feeling bad. We have this uncertainty, right? Nobody really knows what the economy is doing or why. There are a lot of theories, but you know, the key point that you see is like, what the heck? And then there's uncertainty of uncertainty. So the certainty of uncertainty in the economy, how certain we are in being uncertain has increased. This is the second derivative of economic certainty, as Derek has pointed out, as well as others. Even Powell said, we understand better how little we understand inflation, the certainty in being uncertain is increasing, which isn't good. So people are like, I'm so confused and I'm so worried and I don't know what's going on. Inflation creates uncertainty. The primary reason that people are feeling bad is because of inflation. And just to hammer that point home, the inflation print that happened was not pretty. It will get better, but this was a pretty big upside surprise in the most recent inflation print. And uncertainty questions credibility. So this certainty and uncertainty, the idea that no one knows what's going on, especially the Fed, is driving a lot of the narrative. The Fed has now full room to hike 75 basis points or even 100 basis points now, but will they actually do anything? Can the Fed fix this through demand side tools? People are worried that the Fed won't get inflation back down or that they will rip rates right into a recession with the dedication to hiking, even in the face of slowing economic growth. The credibility of the Fed is predicated on a toolkit that might not work. The Fed has a hammer when they really need a power saw. Their toolkit is designed for nudging demand, not increasing supply, which is really what we need. The Fed can't print oil homes and all they really can do is say, hey, you know, stop demanding so much gasoline or hey, like home ownership is the American dream. And we all know that isn't real anymore. There's a supply and demand vibe mismatch. The Fed are vibe destroyers and we need vibe suppliers, which requires fiscal policy and the government's to do something, anything, but that's a whole separate issue. Then there's the narrative. So the Fed really does drive the narrative, which is why they're important. And that narrative is becoming increasingly negative right now. We can see this in microcosms from the recent beige book that came out a few days ago, quote, retailers optimism looking ahead was somewhat tempered by concerns about inflation and a possible recession. So small businesses are feeling bad. According to the recent NFIB survey, both in expansionary plans and expectations of higher sales with inflation being the biggest worry for all of them, with 34% of owners reporting it was their single biggest problem inflation was. Lower sales tip more dominoes. So if companies are worried about lower sales, they're likely to raise prices, right? Like they're going to be like, well, I'm not going to be selling as much. So you better bet I'm going to be charging more. And this paper from the NY Fed highlights that. The paper underscores that it isn't companies that are making more money, rather that companies are raising prices to try and battle inflation, which of course puts downstream pressure on consumers and helps companies make more money. There's always an element of price gouging. I know Oh, <laughs> I know. But you know, when you look at the labor market, there are worries over worker shortages. Over 50% of businesses are reporting jobs that they cannot fill, which is counterintuitive to a recession. So they, there's this inflation narrative path where you have inflation. You have people who are worried about inflation. Companies forecast lower sales. Then they raise prices to make up for the expected lower sales. And then consumers feel worse. And that's a doom loop. All of this is weird. Things are bad. Things are good. Open jobs and higher wages relative to falling production and worries over declines in sales is odd. It's a strange juxtaposition. As Adam highlights. When was the last time GDP was negative for two quarters while we added over 2 million jobs and wage growth decelerated? We're off the map already. There's all this talk about how we aren't in a recession, how we are in a recession, and that there's simply no way 
that we are or aren't because look at the data. But what are we in? So what is a recession? I've written extensively about this and I feel like that there will never be like a natural conclusion to any of that for right now. But I really liked what Alex Williams tweeted out where stag growth, all the indicators are good, but everybody agrees that the vibes are iffy because everything is fluffy. When you have conflicting narratives on top of conflicting interpretations of narratives, of course, things are not going to make sense. A recession is technically a significant decline in economic activity spread across the economy that lasts more than a few months, but this varies and people often will say that a recession is two quarters of declining negative GDP growth. It's not, it's just, it's not, it's really not. I made a TikTok about it and people were like saying that I was an agent of the government. It's just not the definition. (laughs) We had a recession in March of 2020 that lasted one month. So that 2Q thing isn't even plausible. NBER, the Council of Elders decides when a recession is here, looks at depth, diffusion, and duration of economic activity to make that decision, not just GDP metrics, because GDP doesn't encapsulate everything that they need to know about. Metrics that they look at, like real personal income, less transfers, non-farm payroll employment, real personal consumption expenditures, retail sales, and industrial production. But NBER doesn't really have any set rules on how a recession comes about. It's mostly just a decline in economic vibes supported by data. Everyone is worried about a recession, though. This one's again underscores the importance of narrative and vibes. Mortgage rates are dropping because of recession. Oil prices fell because of recession. Bonds are selling off because of recession. Yield curve is inverted because of recession. Wages are falling because of inflation, which definitely can make people feel like they're in a recession. But we're just technically not in one. And I talked about this before, saying like, oh, we're not in a recession. Uh, to somebody who is in a hole is similar to saying to, to that person in the hole, like, oh, good thing you didn't fall away to the bottom, dude. You're still stuck. It, it just doesn't feel good. When you dive into those metrics even more, it gets even more confusing. So oil is a mess right now. Oil took a really big nosedive, which Javier Blas wrote about liquidity and oil market futures is very poor. Several big producer hedging deals. Oil traders reported Wall Street banks buying put options for 2023 in large size. Don't misinterpret one day's price decline as a presaging a relaxation of the pressure that's pushed Brent oil up by more than 50% in the past year. So it's a short-termish combination of liquidity, market mechanics, etc. It's not necessarily recession and coming. It's just things being confusing. And so for jobs, the economy added 372,000 jobs in January. Unemployment was steady at 3.6%. And nominal wage growth grew, but was flattish enough not to spook a wage price spiral. But the household survey was weak, which sort of negates the positives of the payroll's print, as Jason Furman highlighted. In fact, the disconnect between the reported job market and the economy is larger than we've ever seen in the post-World War II data. It is possible the economy is behaving very differently from normal, or also possible that the data is wrong. Output might be doing better than the headlines. See gross domestic income, which is stronger than GDP. So like, yikes, right? It's all market mechanics or data being wrong. But in general, it feels like the data is strong somewhat, but parts of it are starting to noticeably weaken. It's kind of like rotted wood. It can hold up the house for like a few more years, maybe a couple months, but you better do something to ensure the foundation of the house real quick. The Federal Reserve, the Fast and Furious Fed, the FOMC meeting minutes came out two weeks ago now. And the whole thing with that was the Fed is going to rip. They're going to rip rates. They now have the blessing of a strongest jobs report and super high inflation, and they are going to move fast and furious to try and maintain credibility. That is the most important thing that they have, their credibility, what the Fed says. The question then is like too fast and furious. The worry is that the Fed is going to go full restrictive mode right into a slowdown where we do see weakening company earnings, industrial metrics, and more. And it's like, will the Fed hike us right into a recession? Then there's Fed liquidity and credit risk. But the Fed, you know, they're more than just a nudger now. They're a huge part of markets. What does it mean to lose Fed liquidity? As the FT writes, Japan and Europe are both big buyers of US treasuries. And as they go through their own crises, compounded by the Fed no longer backstopping the market, what happens to market functioning? This is super important. The NY Fed wrote a really great piece on the sell-off in treasuries, highlighting that a lot of the sell-off has come from rising term premium and the expectations of tighter monetary policy and rising short-term yield. Ending the paper with, it would take about seven years for investors to recapture losses accrued since the start of the bond market sell-off. Not good. Ed Harrison highlights the risk in credit as leveraged loans, Europe and EM countries. A lot of debt is at risk right now. And when you look at energy, that's still a huge problem. Energy will have to be solved through more supply, which could happen as OPEC promises to increase supply, but still. Nord Stream, which is Germany's big pipeline from Russia, is shutting down for maintenance and is a very big shrug if Russia will choose to reopen it. The EU is shifting nuclear and 
gas to be classified as green energy because like that's what you do in an energy crisis, right? It's a regime shift. And this gets to the changing economic regime. Christine Lagarde said a few weeks ago, I don't think we're going back to that environment of low inflation. This is a change in economic regime, which I'm going to talk about more in a later piece, but we largely aren't used to the economic backdrop that we, are, we seem to be going into. Our interpretation of reality has to shift. But that begs the entire question, what is reality? Existentialist economics, that's excellent, right? That's great, of course. Who doesn't want that? That's kind of a valid question to a certain extent. Like when we think about what is happening with economic metrics and the room for interpretation, it becomes a lot of narrative and reality combining. Things that are true are sometimes not true, but things that are not true are sometimes true. And it's largely just astronomically confusing. And this gets into the vibe. So the bottom part of the vibe session, environmental landscape is important. The combination of experience and evidence shaping expectations which bleeds into perception and interpretation, ultimately shaping our narrative slash world model. There's a theory that we are simply consuming way too much information. We are simply not built to be hearing all of this news all the time, and that totally shapes how we interpret the economy. When we think about perception, social media kind of lets us mask our fear. We are just words on a screen, and that gives us strength because it's the closest that we will ever be to invisible. So we kind of rattle around online, discussing things, consuming information, formulating opinions, and having our reality shaped and molded into some derivative of ourselves. And then there's interpretation where there's this element of nihilism that is pervasive in modern life. A lot of people have written about that with regards to our online selves. So it will lead us to simply price out expectations in a way that makes sense to us based on experience and evidence. So for inflation, we've experienced mega inflation. So like, why would it go back down? It's a weirdness and vibes that is backed by this element of reality that ends up shaping our expectations. And finally, negating a lot of what I just talked about, there's also a really good point to be made that we're just kind of going back to the version of normal that was before the pandemic. Angel List made a good post here where we're simply returning to normalcy, like we're reverting to the mean. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Final thoughts. I like to use my newsletter as a place for economic analysis, but also a place to discuss what it's like to be human in the circumstances because it's so viscerally unexplainable to like experience all this. There's a really good quote from Don DeLillo, which I hope I said his name right, but Don DeLillo, how strange it is. We have these deep, terrible, lingering fears about ourselves and the people we love. Yeah, we walk around, talk to people, eat and drink. We manage to function. The feelings are deep and real. Shouldn't they paralyze us? How is it we can survive them, at least for a little while? We drive a car, we teach a class. How is it no one sees how deeply afraid we were last night, this morning? Is it something we all hide from each other by mutual consent? Or do we share the same secret without knowing it? Wear the same disguise? The reason I like that quote is because I <laughs> the more that you talk to people, the more you realize that everybody is scared or has something that was worrying them or they're not certain about themselves. And I think that the more that we remember that the economy is essentially a collection of human actions, how we spend money, how we spend time, the quantitative and qualitative aspects of our entire existence, the better that we will function. Forecasting is the study of what is next, right? Like what's going to happen? And a lot of times it can sort of be answered, but the answers are sometimes more questions. And I think that that slight uptick at the end of sentence, when somebody is asking a question, tells us more about the economy than any report ever will. It's not just about narrative, but what the narrative itself drives. As George Bernard Shaw said, the single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And this piece on Hive Mind from Game Rant, which is a gaming <laughs> magazine, but I thought it was like a really good article. Non-humanoid hostile aliens are often depicted as hive mind structure. From a narrative perspective, this allows each threat, no matter how different their capabilities are appearance, to pick up where the last enemy left off in combat. It's a built-in form of escalation providing an in-universe explanation for the challenges raising and difficulty like video game levels. And finally, this from In the Wild or Less. The solutions to the problem are very, very often not located in the same spot as the problem itself. A whole lot of issues only get solved by fixing up seemingly unrelated stuff. So there's a lot to think about. You know, there, a lot of things don't make sense, which I know is not comforting. I've also been, and I didn't write about this, but I've also been reflecting on the perma bear doom loop thesis, right? So there's a lot of people out there that make a lot of money telling people that the world is going to end. And there's a lot of people out there that are like, hey, actually, here's something good that's happening. And our little brains are like, no, I only want to hear the bad things because that is rewarding to my little nervous system brain thing. I I think that we really have to be cautious about how we approach the bear doomer stuff where it's like, oh, the world's ending. <laughs> Maybe, right? Maybe not though, but I hope that you all are doing okay. And uh, this is of course a full newsletter and a podcast. I'm on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. 
everywhere. But yeah, thanks so much for hanging out for the past few videos. I know there's been a lot of content recently. I hope that you enjoyed this and I will talk to you all soon. Bye.